Welcome to National Geographic, Episode 7. This is The Eastern Bluebirds of Hollis Crossing by John Prestige. You've just heard, you've just heard some of the sounds made by the Eastern Bluebirds. You many times hear them before you see them because once you're around them you recognize that song and you immediately start looking. They sometimes come in early spring and even some of them stay over in the winter. While you were listening to them you saw how the birds might appear. The males usually arrive a week or so earlier than the females and you see them sitting in the trees without leaves and now you're seeing them along a little bit later in the summer and here they are they're beautiful just sitting up there and the males looking around and trying to find the appropriate nesting box we're going to see an interesting thing here there's two nesting boxes and there's a female looking at one and there's a male looking at the other and they're trying to decide which one would be the better for their nesting you can't have them too close together because there's a lot of competition. Now here is a male sitting on top of a nesting box. And there's another one. And they do uh, kind of sit there and look around and they examine the position of the box, where it's located, is it too close to the woods. They prefer an open field where they can kind of look around and see uh, insects and they, if you put the box too close to the woods, you're liable to get chickadees, which are nice, and you also get the tree swallows, which are also nice, and sometimes you will get the invading, ever-present English sparrow, which is not quite as nice, so we try to discourage that. Here's a male kind of sitting and looking in back of the box, and he's looking around, and finally he convinces a female, as she sits there looking rather dejected and pale, by comparison to his color and she sits there and then pretty soon she gets a little bit more interested and then she'll fly over and we've seen this many times where the two of them will sit there it looks like they're negotiating her nose is up in the air a little bit but they finally reach an agreement and they will uh, uh, stare in she will, they will both build the nest to supply parts for the nest. And here they are actually drinking out of a little uh, medical dosage cup that we have attached to the side of the nesting box. In, in one we will put mealworms and the other we'll put water. Here are the four blue eggs that uh, result from this union of the, of the two birds. Now there are the eggs that have hatched. Here is the male kind of looking over his handiwork and he's waiting for the little ones to start to fledge and they will go up into the treetop and the canopies and hang around for a couple of weeks. Now one of the things I'd like to say is that uh, there's quite a commitment on the part of the people that are going to be tending the boxes. You've got to clean them you got to watch so that they're not open at the wrong time uh, while the fledgings are just too small to uh, move out of the box. I, I sometimes clean them with the front pops open, of course, and I clean it with pine salt because the, the hornets and flying insects don't care for that smell of the pine salt and the birds don't seem to mind. So a couple after each brood, uh, you clean out the old nest, you discard that, take it to the dumpster, don't just drop it on the ground, and you clean it out. The birds are quite clean uh, compared to some of the other ones, uh, but it, it's very important to make sure that these are uh, attractive to the birds because you want to have them do the second and sometimes even the third brood in the same nesting box. Now the pole that holds this box maybe five or six feet off the ground. There's metal and on that 
the, the ground invading insects can come up there. So what I usually do, I several times during the summer will use a product to keep the insects from coming up there. I put STP, which is a special treatment product for petroleum, on the pole to keep the ground uh, insects from invading the, the uh, nesting box. Uh, I do that several times during the summer, and you'll see the pole is just it's so black with the little insects that start up the pole, and just that's where they end up. The nice thing about it, the STP will not break down in the heat. In the, uh, the summer, of course, it gets pretty hot down there, and you wonder how these little birds are going to thrive in that enclosed box. But they can do it. It's sometimes 100 degrees, and they still seem to thrive. Now here you're going to see the uh, the male sitting on top of the house. He's eating the worms. You can see the worms wiggling. And of course, the, the worms aren't free either. You buy them at a bait shop or at a pet store. And they're a little bit costly, but still it's worth it. So what we do, we go buy maybe 50 at a time and we ration them. And, uh, of course, the bird does find its own insects, but it, when it does find this little dosage cup having several worms in it, he says, boy, I think I hit the Powerball. And, of course, the water is there. And sometimes you'll see the bird pick up three or maybe four of these mealworms. And he'll sit and look around, and the, 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 the mate does the same thing, and then they'll take him into the opening there you can see the little birds sticking their open mouths out and now they're accepting the worms and greeting the mother and that's what it's all about we can sit there and we can talk we're 12 or 15 feet away and the little birds are just they're very comfortable with us we've even had some interesting experiences after the little ones uh, fledge uh, say two weeks after they fledge we have been sitting on our deck having lunch or in the evening and all of a sudden here comes some what we believe are the fledgings and my wife has said uh, i think they recognize our voices because we talk normally when we're sitting watching these we talk we have excitement in our voices because it's it is exciting it's a thrill to see because a bluebird that bluebird of happiness is it really is meaningful we like it and we enjoy it and birds have come up and they one actually bounced off the the wall of the deck right behind my wife while we're having lunch and you see them come and sit on the side of a, a oak or a pine tree or a maple tree and surprise they can find the littlest twig on which to sit but it's it's such a pleasure that no amount of work is too much, we feel, to uh, uh, spend in taking care of these birds. There we see a little bird sitting on the side of a tree. And here's another one way up on top. Now here are some of my favorites. Now this is on our bird feeder. Bluebirds come and land there. We see them in the morning up on top of a, pine, a white pine tree. Up again we see them and these are, are really pretty birds and there's some more there's some more now this is really interesting this is the first day of spring and it's wind it looks more like winter and there is a uh, male watching over the nesting box while his mate takes a look inside and she says well i think this is going to be suitable so but to see the snow and see how early they are here and another thing that's interesting is i've never i have assumed the bluebirds will eat suet 
but I have never seen them, but here they are. Here is one sitting on the little suet dispenser, beef suet. Another one where little scrap, scraps of suet have fallen on the ground, and they sit there and consume those. And the following picture is one of my favorites of all time. One little bird takes suet, and he dips it in the water of a heat, warmed, heated bird bath, and you can actually see the ripples on the water, and that is, to me, the ultimate. So this is the end of the production of the Bluebirds of Hollis Crossing. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've had the pleasure of doing it, watching the birds, and the success I've had. And I feel success without sharing is failure. So come on out and see the bluebirds.